Hi, welcome to First Chapter Friday. My name is Lucy, and the book that I am going to be reading, the first chapter of today, is called The Partition Project, and this is by Sadia Faruqi. The Partition Project is a story about a girl named Maha who lives with her family in Texas. They are Pakistani American, and at the beginning of the book, Maha is upset because her grandmother is moving from Pakistan to come live with them. And one of the reasons this upsets her the most is that she has to give up her bedroom to her grandmother. Maya loves journalism. She wants to be a journalist. It is her passion. And she's very rigid in her definitions of what journalism is. She doesn't like novels or fiction because she feels like if something's not telling the real story, it's not valuable. She doesn't like documentaries because she feels like it's not strict reportive journalism. And she has a lot to learn in this book about the ways in which stories are told. The way that Maha learns this lesson the most is through a documentary that she has to make for an elective class that she's taking. And she decides to do her documentary on a historical period of time called the Partition, which happened to India and Pakistan in 1947. The British left the region and changed the borders of those two countries so that people who had been neighbors and friends were now enemies. The British were hoping to divide those regions by religion, Hindu and Muslim. They created a terrible mess in which the loss of life was huge. People had to leave their homes. There were refugees and refugee camps created. Maha learns all about this. She's never heard of it before. She learns about it through talking to her grandmother, her daddy. And she starts to realize that this part of her grandmother's life is so entrenched in who her grandmother is. And she also learns from talking to other people that her grandmother gets to know. She has a realization that family history is your history. It's about who you are as well. And that journalism is a way of telling stories. And there are many different ways to tell stories. So here is chapter one of The Partition Project. It's official. The universe hates me. I'm standing in the passenger arrival area of the Houston airport, trying not to let my irritation show. Face blank, eyes wide, smile frozen. I'm pretty sure it's not working. My older brother, Tala, nudges me with his elbow. It's the arm that's holding a giant golden box of chocolates, like in a cheesy movie. Stop pouting, Maha, he whispers. Easy for him to say, my arms are full of roses that make my nose itch. Still, I flip my ponytail and say, I'm not pouting. You definitely are, he replies, like the whole world is against you. Not the whole world, just my family. The Rahims have been a perfect unit of four until today. Two parents, two kids. The model all-American family, even if we're technically Pakistani-American. But in a few minutes, all that's about to change. The plane from Lahore has landed and soon we'll be adding a fifth person into the mix. Dottie, my grandmother. That's Abba's mom who adopted him when he was a baby, who's lived in Pakistan all her life until today. I can already predict it's going to be terrible. As a future journalist, I should find this fascinating. Journalism is all about recording changes in the world around you and then telling people about them. But as a 12-year-old kid whose life is about to turn upside down, Oh yeah, I'm definitely pouting. Shut up, I whisper to Tala. You shut up, he shoots back, then shakes his head like he's regretting it. Ha, it's fun when I can get a rise out of him. Make him forget he's 15. Kids, don't argue, please, Abba says sternly. He's wearing his best suit and a nervous expression on his face. I guess it makes sense. His mother is about to walk through the sliding doors in front of us and change our lives forever. We want to welcome Dottie with happy faces, Ami adds. Make her feel like she's part of the family from day one. That's a joke, because Ami's looking even more nervous than Abba. She's only met Dottie a few times since my parents got married 20 years ago. I bet she's thinking of all the bossy and demanding mothers-in-law in Pakistani dramas. On Friday evenings, Ami relaxes in the living room, watching shows on YouTube and eating cheesecake or brownies. I often join her, even though the Urdu is hard to follow. The dramas are boring, but spending time with Ami is super important to me. 
because she's busy the rest of the time. The sliding doors open and a wave of people pushing giant trolleys full of luggage comes through. It's mostly families with kids. The noise level of the crowd waiting outside rises sky high. Everyone's waving, many are hugging each other. There are a lot of balloons and flower exchanges happening around us. What wouldn't I give to be holding a balloon or two instead of this giant bouquet of roses? I look at the faces around me, trying to see if Dottie's one of them, even though I'm not sure if I'll recognize her. I mean, I've seen pictures, but Abba mostly video chats with her during his lunch break at the hospital. All I know is she's got white hair in a bun and more wrinkles than I've ever seen on one person's skin. Ami leans forward to peer at the crowd. She's not here yet. Her flight landed half an hour ago. Abba mutters, checking the time on his phone. She still has to go through immigration and customs. And then she's got to find her luggage, Tala adds. How will she do that by herself? I can't help but ask. Not that I care, but still, I'm curious. Everyone knows curiosity is the best quality a true journalist can have. Well, that and mad writing skills. Don't worry, Maha, she's got a wheelchair assist, Ami explains, putting an arm around me. Well, how much longer, I ask, trying not to whine. Abba gives me a stern look, the one he's famous for, only it's usually directed toward a patient who's not following orders. Manor, he bites out. Oops, he's using my full name, which means he's very serious. I swallow. Yes, Abba? Your grandmother is coming from 8,000 miles away, sitting on a plane for close to 20 hours with a host of ailments like arthritis and high blood pressure. The least we can do is stand here for a few more minutes to give her a warm, loving welcome. I nod quickly and try my frozen face one more time. Yes, of course. Taha nudges me again. He doesn't say anything, but his smirk is super annoying. Then Abba turns to him and snaps. Stop bothering your sister. Taha loses the smirk and stands straight. You're right, I'm sorry, no more arguing. Abba shakes his head and goes back to his phone. I'm guessing he's checking emails because he took the day off from the hospital to be here today. That's basically a sign of the end times or something. I can't remember when he last took the day off. Ami likes to laugh and say the hospital can't run without him. She should know because they work together although in different departments. Abba's frown whenever she says this tells me it's not really a compliment. Then Ami pats his shoulders and says she's just kidding. But is she really? That's why I like journalism so much. It's all about facts, news, information. I don't know how to deal with people and their weird secret opinions, saying one thing and meaning another. It's all totally stupid. Tala calls it subtext. I have no clue what that means. But it seems awful. I'm all about the text. No subtext allowed. Thank you very much. The airport sounds swell like a wave around me, high, then low, loud, then soft. The walls are gray, and the carpet is a dull brown color that should be outlawed. Metal chairs nailed to the floor are scattered around in a geometrical pattern. There's a snack kiosk in the corner and another kiosk selling flowers, just like the ones I'm clutching in a death grip. My phone pings with a notification. I shift my roses into one hand and reach into my pocket with the other. It's a message from my best friend, Kim Huang. Kim, is your grandma here yet? I edge backward until I reach a wall and slide down to the floor. Me, not yet, please help me, I'm dying. Okay, no self-respecting journalist would forget about spelling or punctuation, but I'm too tired and stressed out to care. Plus, it's just Kim. We understand each other. Ami turns to me. Maha! She gasps like I've committed a crime. Get up! That floor is probably disgusting. My legs are hurting. I reply without looking up. I'm wondering if I should retype my text message with a comma or two. You should have eaten that banana before we left. Like I told you to, Ami tells me with a sniff. It's got potassium and vitamin B6 to boost your energy. I ignore her. I wish she'd stop being a dietitian when she comes home from work, but it's like she just can't switch it off. I know more about vitamins and antioxidants and other diet info than any kid my age. If I wanted to be a food writer when I grew up, I'd be golden. Just then, the sliding doors open again. Another crowd of passengers erupts from the airport like prisoners getting free. 
A few people waiting outside shriek, Salam! And one person starts crying very loudly. Yikes, these airport reunions are off the charts weird. My phone pings, Kim. When will she arrive? Can't wait to meet her. Me, why? It's gonna be awful. I have to give up my room and my freedom and my position as the queen of the Rahim family. Kim, dramatic much? Me, you have no idea. Kim's grandparents all live in Vietnam. She visits them every summer, but they've never come to the United States. I think she's hoping daddy will be the American grandmother she's been dying for. Nope, not happening. There's another commotion up front. Finally, Ami says, I look up right in the front of the latest crowd of passengers is a wheelchair pushed by a man in a uniform. Me. Gotta go, she's here. I get up from the floor and frantically dust my butt. The roses almost fall, but I tighten my suddenly sweaty hands around them. That's her, Abbas shouts and rushes forward. My mouth gapes open. I've never seen my father rush toward anything. He's so calm and steady. Ami follows at a slower speed, and Talha and I bring up the rear, like we're a procession, bogged down by flowers and chocolates and nervous relatives. We reach the wheelchair and stop. I'm the shortest, so I have to peek between Ami and Talha to get my first look at the newest addition to our family. And that is the end of chapter one of The Partition Project. I absolutely loved this book. I learned so much about the history of India and Pakistan and the partition that happened in 1947. I really had a lot to learn about that. And through Maha's learning and through her documentary and her conversations with her grandmother, this book is full of really good information about that. Not only the historical information, but also how that event impacted the lives of the people who lived it and continues to impact the lives of further generations. There are so many great facets to this book. Maha has a lot to learn about being a good friend and about sharing interests with friends and trying to learn about what they're doing, not just being so absorbed in what you're doing. She's very competitive and she's very set in her ways, but she starts to lose some of that rigidity through some of the people she meets and some of the things she learns. It's revealed to her right when they pick her grandmother up from the airport that not only does she have to give up her room, but she has to be her grandmother's babysitter. Both of her parents work full time. Someone has got to be there for daddy who's never lived in this country before. And that is falling to Maha. One of the things that that entails is taking her grandmother to the senior center every Saturday. At the senior center, they meet a lot of other people who are Pakistani, who lived through the partition. Maha starts to learn a lot more about her religion, Muslim religion, which her family has never been really strict in practicing. And through conversations with her grandmother and other members of the senior center, she learns a lot about the history of India and Pakistan. And her relationship with her grandmother also changes. I think that that is probably my most favorite part of this book. I love a story where people of different generations connect in some way. That intergenerational relationship is just really interesting to me. And I think it's such a strong and wonderful part of this story. There are so many amazing things about this book. I really recommend that you read The Partition Project by Sadia Faruqi. Thank you for joining me.